Wow, it's been a long time since I made a video, but I recently checked the channel and we made it to 100 subscribers, which is kind of pathetic, frankly, but I figured I'd make a video anyways. So let's talk about shock absorbers. So first of all, what is a shock absorber? What does it do? Well, a shock absorber or a damper is basically a friction machine. If you push on it, it pushes back. If you pull on it, it pulls back. It just resists the motion of the wheel which keeps it on the ground. So if you didn't have a shock absorber, uh, when you hit a bump, it would sort of like bounce up and down on the spring and there's nothing to rein it in basically. Shock absorbers keep the car controlled. And this is achieved by pushing a piston through a fluid. In this case, it's oil. So there's a piston inside a tube and that tube is filled with oil. The piston has little holes in it called valves. And when you push the piston through the oil, the oil is forced through those little valves, which creates resistance and then you get your damping properties. So now that we know the fundamentals, let's look at the types of shock absorbers. And today we're just gonna be looking at the two basic types of shocks, that's twin tube and monotube. And you probably won't be surprised to find out that a twin tube is made with two tubes and a monotube is made with one tube. The monotube shock is probably what you imagined when I was just describing what a shock absorber does. Uh, it's just a tube with a piston in it filled with oil, piston moves through the oil. And it also has on the end of it, it will have a floating piston with pressurized gas on one side and the oil on the other side. And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, the twin tube, uh, roughly the same setup, except you have two tubes. Uh, one is bigger than the other and the small one is inside the big tube. So you, have, you still have a piston going through the oil. Uh, the piston's in the inner tube and the space between the two tubes is connected to the space in the middle. So the oil can flow freely and then you have another gas space in the outer area. The biggest functional difference between these two shocks is the amount of damping that they can provide and their endurance. So the, the amount of time that they can sustain uh, uh, abuse on say a bumpy road without losing their damping properties. So let's talk cavitation. Uh, when you heat up a liquid, uh, eventually it will start to boil. So for example, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at sea level. What most people don't realize is that that boiling temperature is actually related to the pressure that's on the fluid. So if you take that same cup of water and take it up to the top of Mount Everest, it will actually boil at 71 degrees instead of 100 because there's less pressure at the top of the mountain than there is at sea level. So what does Mount Everest have to do with our shock absorbers? Well, when you're pushing a piston through that oil, uh, it's forcing it through those little valves. It's creating, it's creating a big pressure differential. That's where the resistance force actually comes from. And if you push it fast enough, you actually get a low enough pressure on one side of that piston that it can boil the oil inside of it and create little air bubbles that get stuck in the oil. Those bubbles created by the low pressure, that's called cavitation. Another phenomenon that's very similar to cavitation is called aeration. Uh, the end result is the same. You get little bubbles in the fluid. Uh, but aeration is just caused by jostling of the fluid. So you know, um, when you look at a fish tank, they have sometimes they have those little waterfalls. The waterfalls are just meant to stir up the water a little bit and get some air infused into it so that the fish can breathe. The cavitation and aeration both result in tiny little bubbles ending up in the oil. Why do we care about that? Well, the answer is viscosity. Remember when I told you that shocks are just friction machines? Well, if you reduce the viscosity, it thins out the oil. It makes it easier for it to flow through those valves and you get less friction, which means that the piston can move through that oil a lot easier and it reduces the performance of the shock. You get less damping force. We can see looking at the construction of these shocks that aeration is going to be a much bigger problem in the twin tube shocks because the oil and the gas are actually in the same chamber. They're touching each other. So if you're going over a bumpy road, that oil can get thrown around a little bit and the air can get infused inside of it. Whereas in the monotube shock, they're physically separated from each other by that floating piston. So aeration is physically not possible and you get more endurance out of a monotube shock. So what about cavitation? Where does that come from? Why did I tell you about that? Well, that's again where the monotube shock shines. Remember cavitation is caused by the low pressure caused by that piston being forced through the oil. If you look at the construction of these shocks, the monotube shock has a much larger piston, whereas the twin tube shock, because it has those two tubes, it leaves less space in the middle for that piston. And pressure is force divided by area. Uh, 
So if you have a larger area with the same force, you get less pressure. So the end result of that is the same damping force in a monotube and a twin tube, the monotube will end up with less pressure and less cavitation, which will give it more endurance. The, the flip side of that is if you wanted to design the tube for the same amount of cavitation, you would end up with a stiffer damping force in the monotube. So the monotubes can provide much more damping force than a twin tube shock. And this is why they're very popular in sports cars and in racing, because in applications where you need a stiff spring, you also need a stiff shock absorber to resist that spring so you don't bounce around all over the place. So I've mentioned these gas chambers multiple times. What are the gas chambers for? Well, the gas is a pressurized gas, usually nitrogen or oxygen. And all it does is it pressurizes that fluid so that you don't get cavitation. The cavitation is caused by low pressure, remember. So if you just put a static pressure on it from that compressed gas, you can push that piston back and forth a lot faster and you don't get cavitation because you don't get that super low pressure. So finally, let's talk about the consequences of the physical construction of these shocks. First, we're gonna look at durability. So with a twin tube shock, it's actually gonna have more durability than a monotube because if you were to dent that shock, you hit it with a rock or something, I don't know, um, the outer casing is just that air chamber. It's not actually going to interfere with the, the movement of the piston. Whereas the monotube, that outer skin is really all you have. If you dent that, you're now interfering with the movement of that piston and the shock is basically garbage. The second consequence is mounting positions. With the monotube shock, because your oil and the gas are separated, you can turn that shock anywhere you want. You can mount it in any position you like and it will function perfectly fine. Whereas the twin tube shock, because everything is in the same chamber, you have to keep it vertical and the right way around in order for it to function properly. If, if the air gets where it shouldn't be, you can run into problems and the shock is not going to perform. And lastly, the difference that most people are going to notice immediately is price. The monotube shocks, because there's more moving parts in them and because they're typically associated with sports applications and racing applications, they're generally built to a higher standard to begin with. Uh, the monotubes are typically much more expensive than the twin tube shocks. And that's everything, so let's look at a summary from what we've learned today. The monotube shock will offer you more endurance. You'll be able to go on a bumpy road for much longer. You'll be able to do high performance driving for much longer without the shock degrading and without losing your damping force. The monotube is also capable of delivering much higher damping coefficients, which makes it ideal for sports cars and racing. Uh, it also has much more flexible mounting options, which again is great for racing where you might have a very small car and you sort of have to put the shock wherever it'll fit. The twin tubes on the other hand have the advantage for durability. If you dent that outer casing, it's not going to affect the shock's performance as long as it's a small dent. Uh, and the other advantage of course, the twin tubes are less expensive. So that's really it. That's the end of the video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Remember to like, subscribe, all that nonsense, and I'll see you next time.